Good morning. If you have not figured it out yet, we are going to talk about the Holy Spirit today. Uh, I think the lead-in was spot on. Yeah, I know, you're tired, aren't you? Oh, just ignoring Yeah, I know. Uh, I'm glad each of you is here today, and I hope you're excited to be here worshiping it. That's what we're here for, right? To worship God. So, um, actually, this is... Nancy and I have talked a couple of times over the past few weeks, and we were really excited that, that we were going to talk about the Holy Spirit today in, in depth, because we talk about the Holy Spirit every Sunday. But this next image really, really shows how, I, how excited I am today. Um, I'm excited. that If you're not familiar with that image, that is a Tarsier's monkey. They are the smallest monkeys in the world. They grow to an average height of four to six inches. And their eyes look really, really big, like they're bulging out of their head, when in reality they are not. They're just really, really big for the head they're in. Because their eyes are only, they're smaller than a dime in diameter. But they look a whole lot bigger. The reason I put that image up there was so I wouldn't have to make that face. Um, these monkeys are found in the Philippines, and there are places there where you go and you pay money, and they lead you through the forest, and you have to try to spot these little things in the trees. People pay money to do that. Uh, yes, I paid money to do that. Uh, but the, these little monkeys are the attraction. They're the guests of honor. And if you've looked in your bulletin today and you see the title of the message is The Guest of Honor, I'm sure you figured out that the guest of honor in this place is the Holy Spirit. What my goal is and what God's goal is, is that the guest of honor in this place is the Holy Spirit. Not just in this building, but in us. That God gets the glory. That his spirit gets the glory. I'm excited this morning, and yet it's been another really, really trying week for some of us. Generally, what's about to happen is for you. I didn't know who it was for, but it's going to be for you, and I'm sure it's going to be for other people here, too. We have church family members and other family members who are in hospitals and in nursing homes and at home dealing with different levels of health struggles and with loss of loved ones. We have the worries and temptations of this world that we deal with on a daily basis. And it may just be me, but I know it's not now. It seems like it's been piling up, doesn't it? It just seems like things have, have really been piling up around here. We have information, both true and false, coming at us from all different directions at all times and at the fastest pace in the history of of mankind. We have all these things going on, and guess what? Sometimes we get tired, don't we? Sometimes we get scared. Sometimes we get lazy, we get confused, and we get off track in our spiritual walk or in our spiritual growth. Anybody here know what I'm talking about? Yeah, I'm, I'm sure you do. As I was thinking about that during the past week, I came across an image that made me breathe a sigh of relief, and brought a smile to my face. Jenna Lee, Jesus still loves you. Isn't that good to know when all this other garbage is going on? Jesus loves you regardless of your struggles. Jesus sometimes love us, loves us because of our struggles and how we respond to those struggles. No matter what happens in life, no matter if you mess up or if life messes up on you, no matter the circumstances, that right there is true. Jesus still loves you. So like I said, that's for me and for everybody else who needs to hear it this morning. Now I'm going to switch direction for a minute, as I've been known to do in the past, and ask you yet another question. I want to talk about something that we've talked about in the past. I want to talk about anticipation. Who remembers that commercial? Some of you are way too young to remember that commercial. <laughs> Anticipation, it's making me wait. They played the song on the commercial, and we were supposed to infer that that ketchup was so good, it was worth waiting for it to come out of the bottle. Anticipation is looking forward to something, confident that it's going to happen. 
So here's the question. Have you ever been expecting a visitor, not knowing what time they're going to arrive, but you know they're coming? I'm talking about somebody you might not have seen in a while, or maybe even somebody that you're finally going to get to meet for the first time, and you know they're coming. That's the kind of anticipation I'm talking about. My wife can tell you that at times like that, I have a habit of pacing and looking out windows. I don't know why. I think it's like the watch pot that never boils. It's not going to make them get there any faster. But it's the anticipation, the excitement of knowing that somebody's coming. We all anticipate things in our own way. And right now, some of you are anticipating me getting to the point. I will... You just have to be patient. Right now, you might be wondering what Tarsier's monkeys and anticipation have to do with a message from God's Word, and I'm going to get to that too, but just not yet. Before I do, I want to introduce the next series of messages that we're going to be dealing with over the next few weeks. We have just come off of spending half a year Studying the Sermon on the Mount. Half a year. Time flies when you're having fun, right? 25 messages based on the teachings of Jesus. And starting today and going through the end of October, I'm going to be focusing on the book of Acts. If you're a regular here at Walton Hills Church of Christ, you know I'm guilty of trying to come up with sermon titles and series titles that are going to capture your attention and hopefully generate a level of interest or even anticipation. You see how I work that in there? That's my goal. And in my efforts to do this, I considered a number of different things for this particular series. I imagined what you might think if I called the series Acting Up. Now, you see, you laugh, but if we're relating it to the church, where should our focus be? up. But I knew some of you wouldn't see it that way. So I didn't do that. I also considered using acting out as a title. And amazingly, this is what popped in my mind. Seeing you guys do this on Sunday morning. The adult version, obviously, but that could very easily happen. (laughs) So I didn't do that. Again, as with the acting up idea, the graphics were readily available, and the twist would have been looking at the actions of the early church from the perspective of what impact those actions might have outside the church. Because that's really where our focus should be, right? We come here to worship God. We go out there to spread the gospel. I felt like both of those titles had potential, yet something kept me looking through images. Before I get to my final choice, let me leave you in anticipation one more time while I take one more brief detour. Here at Walton Hills Church of Christ, even though we're an independent congregation, we claim membership in a brotherhood of other independent Christian churches and churches of Christ known as the Restoration Movement. Some of you are very familiar with the history of that restoration movement, and some of you are not, but it's a movement that started in the early years of our nation, started in America in the early years of our nation, and the driving motivation among the leaders of the movement was the desire to see the church restored to the way it was immediately following the years when Jesus ascended, the years after Jesus ascended. In my opinion, that's a noble desire And yet, as you can imagine, people can twist it into whatever figuration they want it to look like. And people who misunderstand the concept will say things like this, well, if you're going to be like the early church, you need to meet in homes or outside and not in these big, giant church buildings. There's some truth to that. Or they might say, if you're going to be like the early church, get rid of the hymnals and the piano and the air conditioning and the padded seats and the furnace and the fill in the blank, whatever it is they want to get rid of that they didn't have in the first century. I say people understand the, misunderstand the concept because when we talk about 
restoring the church to its original form. We're not talking about where we gather or how we worship. We're talking about why we gather and why we worship. We travel that circular path that Jesus led us along during the Sermon on the Mount. It takes us from focusing on what we're doing and how we're doing it and all the way back around to why we're doing it. What is the motivation? And if the motivation is not lifting up the name of Jesus, then we're missing the mark. So whether we want to think about it as acting up or acting out, the best graphic I could find, and again, this is in my humble opinion, the best title graphic I could find. Are you ready? Are you in anticipation? We are the church. Let's act like it. Uh Uh-oh. Now it's for us. Now it's a call to us. We are the church, and if we want to be the church that Jesus established to carry out his work until he returns, we have to know how that church functioned in the beginning. One thing that we will learn is that while the apostles did their very best to continue what Jesus had started, dysfunction pretty quickly became part of the function of the church. We look around today and we see all this dysfunction in our families, in our homes, and in our church, and we wonder why it's nothing new, church. Somebody will ask me later, and I'll tell you, and I'll tell them, it's Satan. It's the influence of the world and the enemy trying to stop the church. What we're going to do, understanding that dysfunction is part of the function, over the next couple months is we're going to focus on what we would call in the business world today the best practices of the church. And the best practices of the church are those that point to Jesus. My prayer is that you'll eagerly anticipate these messages as I eagerly anticipate studying for them and delivering them. Now that I've bombarded you with all that information, I'm going to finally get around to the sermon and the text for this morning. If you've been paying any attention at all, you'll remember that I said we're going to be in the book of Acts. In the first chapter of the book of Acts, Luke, the author, gives an account of the last time the apostles met with Jesus on earth before Jesus returned to heaven. And he also gives an account of those same apostles choosing a replacement for that traitor, that Judas, someone to stand in Judas's place. One of the phrases that's been used by people in the restoration movement is that we desire to be an Acts 2 church. So that's where we're going to start. We're going to start in Acts chapter 2 to begin this series. Some translations of the Bible have chapter headings. I don't know if yours does. Uh, They're not part of the original text, and in this case, the NIV has a heading that says, The Holy Spirit comes at Pentecost. That's significant for a couple of reasons. First, the day of Pentecost was a major Jewish festival, meaning that the Jews would have made the pilgrimage to Jerusalem to celebrate. This was no accident. This was no coincidence. This was an opportunity to reach as many people as possible at one time. So let's read what happened as described by Luke, and then we'll do our very best to see how it applies to our lives. Acts chapter 2, beginning at the beginning, says this. When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Suddenly a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came down to rest on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. Now there were staying in Jerusalem, God-fearing Jews from every nation under heaven. When they heard this sound, a crowd came together in bewilderment because each one heard their own language being spoken. 
Utterly amazed, they asked, aren't all those who are speaking Galileans? Then how is it that each of us hears them in our native tongue? Parthians, Medes, and Elamites, residents of Mesopotamia, Judea, and Cappadocia, Pontus, and Asia, Phrygia, and Pamphylia, Egypt, and the parts of Libya near Cyrene, visitors from Rome, both Jews and converts to Judaism, Cretans and Arabs, we hear them declaring the wonders of God in our own tongues. Amazed and perplexed, they asked one another, what does this mean? Some, however, made fun of them and said, they have had too much wine. They're drunk. That last verse right there is one that must have been more easily understood in the moment than it is by us 2,000 years later. I mean, how could being drunk make them be able to communicate better to the people in the audience? It doesn't, I would think more the people in the audience might have been drunk thinking they were speaking Galilean when they were actually speaking whatever language they were speaking, but that's just my observation. But imagine the scene on this day. Imagine how the apostles felt. Imagine how the people in the crowd felt. Imagine how you would have felt if you would have been there. To imagine, <clears throat> excuse me, clearly, we have to read these words very carefully. For example, verse 2 says, Suddenly a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. Who was up very early this morning? Did you hear the wind? And the thunder? Did you get wet? No. That's what I find interesting about this. That's what it says. What it doesn't say is what makes it special. It says the sound of the blowing of the wind came, but it doesn't say any other evidence of the wind was present. It doesn't say things were blown around the room and that all of the apostles' notes got scattered everywhere or anything like that. It says the sound of the wind filled the house. It's the same with verse 3. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came down to rest on each of them. It doesn't say fire fell on them in a physical sense. It doesn't say anything got burned up or even singed. The sound of the wind and the sight of what, might, of what seemed like fire without any of the expected side effects are what make this scene so dramatic to me. And we recognize that it isn't these sights and sounds that even draw the crowd. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. Now they were staying in Jerusalem, God-fearing Jews from every nation under heaven. When they heard this sound, the sound of the apostles speaking in languages, not the sound of the wind, but when they heard this sound, a crowd came together in bewilderment because each one heard their own language being spoken. These people from different places and speaking different languages are able to understand the message. Why? There's only one explanation. It's the work of the Holy Spirit. It's nothing that the apostles have done except they've been obedient. But it's the work of the Holy Spirit that brings the understanding. The Holy Spirit allows the apostles to speak in languages that the listener can understand. And while the crowd doesn't yet understand that fact, at least one of the apostles does. Next week, we're going to look at how Peter responds to the crowd as he delivers what's considered to be the first post-ascension evangelistic sermon. Obviously, Jesus preached the message, but once he went to heaven, that job was left to Peter. We know that the apostles had been anticipating the arrival of the Holy Spirit because Jesus had told them, 
the Spirit would come. We already read one verse that said that in our responsive reading this morning. They didn't know where. They didn't know when. I would like to think or imagine that some of them were pacing around the house, waiting. That'd make me feel pretty good. But who knows? We don't know. In his account of the ascension, Luke quoted Jesus as saying, and this is from Acts chapter 1, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. How could that be possible if the people couldn't understand them? It wouldn't have been. But they received the power when the Holy Spirit came on them. That's exactly what has happened in the text that we read from chapter 2. In the Gospel of John, in chapters 14 and 15, Jesus repeatedly tells the apostles that they won't be alone once he's gone. John 14, 16 says, And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate to help you and be with you forever. 14, 26 says, But the advocate, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things and will remind you of everything I have said to you. Finally, in John 15, when the advocate comes, whom I will send to you from the Father, the Spirit of truth who goes out from the Father, he will testify about me. Wouldn't life and your spiritual walk be so much easier if you had somebody to guide you? You do. We'll get to that in a couple of minutes. But you do. After all that these followers of Jesus had been through, his closest friends had been through the highs and lows of Jesus' earthly life, death, burial, and new life, and I'm convinced that they would have greatly anticipated the arrival of the Holy Spirit of God. Jesus told them he was going to die, and he died. He told them he would be raised from the dead, and he was raised from the dead. He told them he was going to prepare a place for them, and he left. Why would they not believe that the Spirit was coming? We talk about the Holy Spirit often and about his work and influence in our worship service and in our lives. Just like those in the first century, we can find ourselves bewildered at times, unable to figure out what exactly is causing all this? Why do all these things sometimes seem to be falling right into place in spite of us? What we need to do if we're going to truly be the church as outlined in the New Testament, in my humble opinion, is threefold. Number one, we need to acknowledge the existence of the Holy Spirit. If the Holy Spirit doesn't exist, we're wasting our time. Because I don't know about you, but I'm pretty weak in my own strength. Number two, we need to accept the gift of the Holy Spirit, allowing God's Holy Spirit to live in us. I have a friend in the back row back there. This is for you, my friend. Number three, we need to get out of the way and let the Holy Spirit work through us to impact and influence the world. You are not going to change anybody's mind about anything when it comes to God. But the Holy Spirit working through you can work in other people. Sometimes we're just too busy trying to do things our way. We may even hear that small, still voice telling us, don't do that, don't do that, don't do that. Remember, Paul wanted to go to Mesopotamia, and the voice said, don't go there. But we think we know better, so we go places we shouldn't be, and we try to do things we shouldn't be doing when we should be listening and being led by the Spirit of God. And after looking at that, I realized that those things might be out of order. Maybe they should look like this. Maybe the first thing we need to do is accept the gift of the Holy Spirit. 
Maybe that comes first. Because how, you, how can you acknowledge the existence of the Holy Spirit if you've never experienced the existence of the Holy Spirit? So maybe we should do it that way. Because it is likely that we can only be certain of and acknowledge the existence of the Holy Spirit after we have Him living in us. In the following weeks, you're going to be hearing more about how that takes place because it's the, going to be the core of the invitation week after week for the next couple of months. On the back of your printed bulletin, there's a paragraph that tells you that each week we offer a couple of invitations. We invite you to have us pray for you, either publicly or privately, if that's something you would like for us to do. Uh, we also invite you to formally join our church family if you're looking for a church home and you feel led to do that. There's a third invitation listed there as well. But what I want you to understand is that that invitation does not come from me. It does not come from this pulpit. It does not come from this church. It comes from the living Christ. Jesus invites you to make a decision. Jesus came not to condemn, but to rescue. That's what the word says. God's will is that none should die, but that all should come to salvation. How do I do that, you might ask? Isn't it interesting that that's the same question asked by those who were gathered that day, that day of Pentecost, what, what must we do to be saved? The answer is simple, and like I said, you're going to hear it over and over again in the next few weeks. To put it in today's language, Eugene Peterson in the message paraphrases it like this. Peter said, change your life. Turn to God and be baptized, each of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, so your sins are forgiven. Receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. I cannot say it any better than Peter said it. That's the invitation. Change your life. Turn to God and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ to receive salvation and the gift of the Holy Spirit. Let's pray. God, we love you so much. And we know that you love us so much that you've provided a way for us to live with you forever and ever and ever and ever in your presence. A time of the gathering of your children and eternal worship, eternal celebration, eternal life. We've said it here already today, life can be challenging, life can be difficult, life can be scary, life can be a lot of things. But true life, abundant life, full life comes from a relationship with you through your son Jesus and through the gift of of the Holy Spirit. So I pray if there's anyone here today that's never made a decision to lay down control, to step out of the way and allow your Holy Spirit to take over, to allow that small voice to guide them and to challenge them and to lead them in their growth in their relationship with you, that they would make that decision today. It sounds difficult, it sounds challenging, but it's very simple. That first step is to confess your son as Christ, be buried in the waters of baptism, and raised into new life filled with the Holy Spirit. As for the rest of us, Father, I pray that we would desire so much to be the church that we would act like it. That we would go from this place, from this time of worship, to a time where people can see that we're different because we love you, and we love each other. And through seeing that, they might want to know more about your son. He's our savior. And it's in his name I pray, the wonderful name of Jesus. And the church said. Please rise for our song of invitation.